Thank you, Shireen. I'm feeling so many things after that presentation, so I'm feeling um, in no particular order. Uh, deeply honoured to have been invited to come to speak for, for uh, an organisation that I have been an admirer of for a long time, so it's almost hard to believe actually that I'm here. Uh, and thank you for your invitation very much. Uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to see you all feel so good about yourself, so excited about the work that you do and uh, the accomplishments that you have made so extraordinary so far on a personal and global level. And um, I'm very moved by the video that was just shown. It, one of the things that, that the video said to me is that it, it's just really time to stop thinking of ourselves as defined by nations. I think that time has passed. No more of that. All of the world's children are our children. Isn't that right? So I, I want to dedicate my presentation this morning um, uh, especially to all of those people that have suffered directly or indirectly uh, as a result of the, uh, the recent violence, um, that violence around the world that has been defined as terrorism and that violence that has been given other names. And so, excuse me for a moment while I um, get the slideshow started. I have some pretty pictures to show you, so we need to connect. That's, that's good. Thank you. Evolution isn't what it used to be. Modern science has uncovered another second layer of evolution in which human society can change dramatically and very rapidly without the species having to change. So I thought this aspect of evolution needed a name, and I'd like to call it neurosocial evolution. And I'll begin by explaining what neurosocial evolution means, what do I mean by that, and why I think that it's such exciting news. And the purpose is so that you can see the vital and the central role that you all play as parents and also in your profession in driving humanity's evolution forward. When most people think about evolution, we think of Darwin. We think of that lucky giraffe that through some quirk of uh, genetic mutation was born with a longer neck, was suddenly able to eat the leaves in the higher part of the tree to succeed and therefore to have more offspring and so on and so on, the natural selection kind of process. And that is a very slow aspect of evolution. It takes millions of years. But we do not have that long, we as humans. The symbolic doomsday clock moved to three minutes before midnight because of climate change and similar things, similar phenomena. And this is the gravest threat to humanity, it is said, since the Cold War. And right here, right here I'm talking about our collective violence towards Mother Earth. What chance do we have of evolving past a violence of this kind? So I'm proposing that there's another kind of evolution that affects human beings, neurosocial evolution. And fortunately, this moves much, much faster. Societies can evolve very quickly. Behavior can transform as an adaptation to our changing environment. And we can achieve this because we're so vulnerable to our environment. The world around us changes our brains, our brain chemistry, our genetic makeup. That's what I call neurosocial evolution. The higher the animal, the more complex the brain Therefore, the more complex pattern of social behavior that can change far more rapidly than Darwin's random gene mutation can explain. Humans diversify. We diversify rapidly. That's what we do. We can move from competitive and aggressive styles of culture, what anthropologist Rianne Eisler called the dominator culture. We can move to collaborative, harmonious partnership styles of culture in years, or take giant leaps in one generation, rather than waiting for millennia to change as a species. So that when somebody said, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose, the more things change, the more they stay the same, I don't know who they were talking about. Human beings do nothing but change. 
I want to show you some examples of that. Do you know there are over 7,000 living languages? A dizzying array of cultures. It's not just our clothing that varies, not just our foods, but the fundamental rules of relationship. Our sexual mores, our styles of authority. Are we going to be warlike or peaceful? In every culture around the world, incredible variety, has been our best guess adaptation to the relative generosities of the environment and the challenges of our immediate environment. A culture is an experiment. We're beautiful, aren't we? I love this one. Isn't that a culture? This is a culture. Extraordinary one. So what is it that drives these rapid diversifications in essential, basic social behaviours, our very, our very basic impulses towards one another, our relationship styles? What drives one group towards more competitiveness, more aggression, and another group towards more empathy? And most importantly, what does your professional work and the work that you do as a parent have to do with all of this? Did you know, by the way, that even baboons create different cultures. The environment changes us very quickly, not as a species, but to new basic impulses and new behaviours. What's been observed in the wild is that baboon societies that exist in an environment of great abundance tend to evolve towards more um, nurturance, uh, less belligerence. And uh, baboons of exactly the same species in an environment that is more arid and challenging, tend to involve towards patriarchy uh, and towards more aggression. Now, that has some very profound and, I think, obvious implications for us. So that the more complex the mammalian brain, the more our social behaviours are wide open to recalibration. Australian biologist Jeremy Griffith is a... Um, I spent years studying the chimpanzees, our nearest cousins, uh, with whom we share 99% of our genes. And he said that the, the common chimpanzee, the one that we're most familiar with, evolved uh, and, and differentiated north of the Congo River, where the environment is a little bit more challenging, more arid, uh, there is more scarcity of food. Now, the common chimpanzee is known to have to be a very patriarchal society, a very warlike society, infanticidal, and in fact, sometimes they have been observed to be genocidal. Contrast this to what happened in the south of the Congo River, which is a place of more abundance, it's far more verdant. The bonobo chimpanzee, very similar, but what a different society. They live in food, beautiful environment. Interestingly, they have evolved the matriarchal culture. They wean their infants at four years. And there is no violence in their culture. It's incredibly rare. They resolve their conflict in, in some very interesting ways, which I won't tell you about here. I'll tell you in the break, if you like, because I don't want to distract you with some of the things that bonobos do. But we are so similar. So look at that. Security drives evolution towards collaborative partnership behavior. That's neurosocial evolution. Security. And so what drove this evolution in humans? What forces have made so many, if not all, so many human societies so warlike and others less so? There was a, an enormous study done by an American anthropologist, George Murdoch. He published it in 1967. It was called the Ethnographic Atlas. It was a study of a database of over 1,100 human societies around the world. Uh, it's understood or at least it's proposed that there was a period of climate change, quite severe climate change, between 6,000 BC, that's 8,000 years ago, and 4,000 BC that saw catastrophic changes in climate, leading to severe desertification across the north of Africa, Central Asia, West Asia. Um, in areas that were previously moist, fertile, there was plenty of food for everybody. Summers got hotter in the northern hemisphere in particular. There was widespread malnutrition, resource insecurity over many generations, which drove neurosocial evolution of the Neolithic people 
uh, that were living there towards more competitiveness. They had to compete for resources, more impulsivity and more aggression. What's understood today, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, is the epigenetic and the neurological changes that are wrought through generations of insecurity and mal malnutrition. Now this led to those people, it's not that there wasn't violence already in societies, it's just that from that point violence was really exacerbated around the world as a survival uh, experiment, I guess, a reaction, a radical increase in warlike behaviour. Now the people of Central Asia that were suffering these changes had a military advantage of the domesticated horse, superior metallurgy, they defeated their rivals um, very, very easily. And you can see on this map how those societies have fanned out in every direction, gradually subsuming, destroying and absorbing every other culture in their path over hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. They invaded, migrated and moved around the world, redefining the nature of human society. So in a sense, when we think of ourselves as human beings, we have, we have a skewed impression of ourselves based on recorded history and our, our skewed impression of our dreadful tendency towards violence. So what is the mechanism through which the environment can alter human social behaviour so rapidly and so radically without there being a species shift? I want to show you two main drivers of neurosocial evolution. And the first one is brain plasticity. As so many of you probably know, we are born with merely 25% of brain mass. And our brains grow so rapidly as they take notes from our social environment that by our third birthday, we have about 90% of our, our final brain mass. So early childhood, all of childhood really, but early childhood most powerfully is a very important window for neurosocial change because the brain is a social organ. It responds to and changes with relationships. And then brain scientists have, um, have been looking at empathy and empathy is not just a sentiment. There is a biology, a neurology of empathy. There are at least 10 uh, empathy centers in the human brain with names such as the medial prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex, frontal operculum, inferior frontal gyrus, caudal anterior cingulate cortex. We will be quizzing you on these at the end of the <laughs> talk, by the way. Uh, you probably, and the amygdala, of course, the famous amygdala. Uh, don't worry about the names of these, but it, it's, uh, I, I just want to convey that this is, this is quite real and of substance. And you probably all have heard about mirror neurons, those specialised neurons that fire in sympathy with the feelings of others. So we have, been, we have been designed to feel a little bit of what other people feel. It's essential in a, in a hugely social animal such as ourselves. Here's the clincher. These brain regions can grow or atrophy according to how empathic is the child's environment. Human relationships grow or shrink the relationship centres of the brain. It gets interesting here and I like to say to people that we the adults are essentially the empathy farmers. We are the empathy farmers for the next generation growing that crop. What we also know from neuroscience and epigenetics is that no human being was ever born destined to lead a life of violence. Chronic violence is the result of severe brain changes. How do these happen? Well, under stress, the brain generates that necessary hormone cortisol, very important, normal, um, a normal process, but when stress does not resolve, when there's trauma, when a child feels great loneliness, hurt or fear, without being comforted, cortisol levels remain high and cortisol is able to become a neurotoxin. So under, when the, the child's brain, particularly the vulnerable early childhood brain, is submitted to prolonged high cortisol, this reduces the prefrontal region 
a region of the brain which is important for impulse control, emotional regulation, and also part of the empathy circuit. You can see this is how environment is sculpting our brains all the time. In an extreme example, the brains of violent sociopaths are heavily damaged in the prefrontal area, responsible for the capacity for empathy, the regulation of emotion, and behavioral self-control. So you can imagine the implica implications of that process. So let's pause and consider this for a moment. Human violence is not intrinsic. It's not, not in the levels that we see and read about uh, in, um, as we did last weekend. That's not intrinsic. It is not unavoidable. We can collectively evolve towards low violence societies. And the good thing is that historically, a few societies, a number of societies, already demonstrably have. So that's what I'm excited to show you later on today. Now, abused children have a cortex that is about 20% smaller. Right now, I'm talking about extremes, such as the children that survived Romanian orphanages, that kind of thing. A brain that is 20% um, uh, smaller. Like, I'm sorry, a cortex that is 20% smaller um, than, than the average child. And this has profound, profound long-term effects on behaviour. I have a hunch that some of you have heard about oxytocin. <laughs> I love how that's become a buzzword. You hear it, you hear it everywhere. That's lovely. So, um, and of course you know that oxytocin um, generates these feelings of, of profound well-being and, and closeness to one another. It's the, it's the hormone of tenderness, of, of, of love, of affection. And, and uh, I encourage you to overdose on this particular drug because in high doses it produces ecstasy and bliss. Uh, and, and bliss is not a private affair. Bliss is shared. Um, so, but there's a double whammy. Uh, and um, it, it's also very exciting to see how more and more people are becoming aware of this. It's being popularised in the media and what a good thing is. Uh, this is. I used to tell this to people and it was like news and it's no longer news. Isn't that great? So that oxytocin is like a fertiliser. It actually nourishes and grows new neural pathways in the brain in those same regions that govern emotional intelligence, empathy, etc. So that our affection you know, healthy attachment, etc. Our way of doing the things that we can't help doing in a loving way for our children, that is growing the empathy centres of their brain just by doing what we can't help ourselves from doing when we're healthy, loving individuals. And, um, and, uh, and, and most relevantly uh, to this group, breastfeeding is, as you know, a very potent generator of oxytocin for mum as well as babies. Had you heard, by the way, that the mother's brain gains weight um, after birth? If you ever gained weight, it was actually a brain doing that. <laughs> Tell everybody. Because, because the, you, you know, you're getting flooded by oxytocin and your brain literally gets bigger. Um, leptin is also generated with all its positive effects. This is through breastfeeding through the positive, with its positive effects on the hippocampus, hypothalamus, pituitary gland. Um, I guess I'm just conveying how, how, how much the brain is changed through um, all loving parenting, but breastfeeding is, is such a central thing of particular uh, potency. And that's why it's, it's great to hear more and more people talking about breastfeeding, not only because of its obvious and, and, and uh, indisputable nutritional and immunological benefits, but also because it's important for the mental health, the relational health of human beings. It's, it's central to responsive attachment with proven massive benefits for behaviour and mental health into the long term. Um, are you familiar with a study by Wendy Oddy, O D Y, published in the Journal of Pediatrics uh, in 2010? Uh, they followed a cohort of 2,900 young people for 14 years, looking at the mental health differences, and they were significant. They were significant. The mental health differences between the breastfed and the not and the not breastfed. It, it's scary information, actually. But, but, not, uh, but, but true, 
and therefore very, very important. So our brains are the stories of our lives and a story of our childhood in particular. And therefore breastfeeding is one very important element of neurosocial evolution towards more cooperative, oxytocin-rich societies. Darwin could not have known that with the technology of his time. There's a second mechanism driving neurosocial evolution and that is the mechanism of uh, epigenetics. It's now understood that violence or our propensity to chronic violence, that's not in the genes. There is no particular violent gene that if you're born with that, you are now destined to be a chronically violent person. Further, it's not just that we're not determined by our genetic profile in the way that was once thought. I'm not saying right now that our genes aren't very, very important. Of course they are. But we're not determined in their behavioural style by our genes, not in the way that was once thought. And furthermore, our environment changes our genetic profile, our genetic expression. Our environment is rewriting our genetic code in one lifespan, most potently in early childhood. We call this the epigenetic switch, in which some genes are switched on, they express, others are switched off, and they remain dormant like a binary system of sorts. Interesting studies by Rachel Yehuda, Y-E-H-U-D-A. They looked at uh, mothers who had been very closely impacted, who were very, very close to the 9-11 uh, attacks and who were traumatised by those attacks. If those mothers were pregnant in the third trimester, they then tested the cortisol levels of their children three years later and they were abnormally high. And they, they attribute that to some epigenetic changes because of the shock and the trauma that the unborn child, together with the mother, would have experienced. Massive implications for what our societies need to do for expectant parents. Um, by the way, I don't think life begins with our birthday. That's so important to understand. Our developmental life begins much before we are born. So, um, but, but at this point, I just want to, I just want to say, um, because this information can, can frighten people, it's also important to, to, to consider or to remind ourselves that the book does not end with damage. With all this information we have now, it's easy to be very frightened of the responsibility of what has happened to my child and will my child be damaged for life because something very stressful has taken place. The book does not end with that. Uh, and much, if not all, of these brain changes and epigenetic, well, definitely the brain changes can be reversed through a variety of healing therapies and more. Uh, there are so many things in life that can bring all kinds of neurological change. Our, our brains remain plastic. Uh, that's become a very popular understanding now. But I'm sure that we would all love to see a massive drop in the demand for healers and for rehabilitators. So Darwin could not have known this stuff about epigenetics either. He would have loved to hear all about it. Um, and I'd like to say this, that if Darwinian evolution, the one that we got familiar with, if Darwinian evolution of the species is like a horse-drawn wagon, neurosocial evolution is like a supersonic jet. It moves fast. So we have some big chances to make a more loving, harmonious and peaceful world. We really do. Can we use these mechanisms of neurosocial evolution to produce more peaceful societies? Yes, we can. And in fact, we have been doing so little by little at an accelerated rate for some time now. And I'm going to show you about that later. But first, let's look at why recorded history has been so very violent. What are the main ingredients needed to create a warlike and violent society? According to anthropologists, if you would like to create a violent society, here is the recipe of how to cook one up. First, that society needs to have a power hierarchy with a boss man at the top, shaped like a pyramid. Bosses at the top, followers that are obedient at the bottom. It needs to be not horizontal and democratic in order for it to be violent. 
the more patriarchal, if on a sliding scale, if you imagine a sliding scale, the more patriarchal a society is, the more violent it is likely to be in terms of domestic as well as intercultural, international violence. That's a really important thing to understand and that's a very, very common finding in anthropology. Um, if you want to create a violent society, it helps to make it sexually repressive with a great rigidity of, of uh, gender roles. But the most important ingredient for creating a violent society is harsh, punitive and authoritarian styles of parenting and of education. So to use the forces of neurosocial evolution, we have been for a long time manipulating the hormonal balances of childhood. We have been manipulating childhood environments to create either the high cortisol society or the high oxytocin society. When there was environmental pressure to adapt by becoming more competitive, we adjust the child rearing to manipulate for the desired epigenetic and psychoneuroendocrinological changes. This produced new behavioral patterns, new models of relationship, and altered the power dynamics of a society. So to move a society towards being more competition oriented, we reduced oxytocin opportunities in early childhood. Okay, I think this was done by design, not consciously necessarily, but by design. And increased, what we also did is to increase cortisol generating experiences, more punishment, more authoritarianism, less nurturance. Warrior societies are known for ritualized harshness towards children. The Spartans, the Aztecs, and so many more are known for ritual, ritual harshness towards children. And all of the warrior societies are, are known for the, so many techniques for varying that hormonal balance of um, early childhood towards the high cortisol, low oxytocin. Isolation of mothers at childbirth, delay of breastfeeding, the denial of colostrum, uh, a lot of corporal punishment of children has been practiced in most cultures. Uh, the ritual mutilation of children's bodies, incredibly widespread. But it is pointless to moralize. That's not what I'm doing here. This was not a, a consciously deliberate act. People don't generally say, I will deny my child warm attachment uh, or I will be more punishing in order to create a child that is more obedient or more tough and battle ready. These decisions are not necessarily made at the individual level. They, they are trends, they are collective. And they become normalized so that in the same way that fish can't see water, our practices of child rearing and education, even, even the, the ones that produce more violence, they seem so normal that they, we don't re remark upon it. These practices do not work reliably in the same way on every individual, but they do work very powerfully across a population. This is not about bad parenting. When you remember that every culture is a human trial and error attempt to adapt to a very, very challenging and sometimes even hostile natural environment. So to summarize, high cortisol childhood moves us towards more competition, aggressive, dominator, patriarchal culture. High oxytocin childhood moves us towards partnership, harmonious, collaborative styles of culture. And then these brain types and epigenetic profiles are passed down intergenerationally via parenting cust customs. So you could say that neurosocial evolution is the movement from a violent authoritarian competition-based society towards cooperation-based democratic societies by moving from the high cortisol child rearing model to the high oxytocin child rearing model. And I know if you are a, a neuropsychologist um, that you would think this is a little bit simplistic, but I need to simplify it for the purpose of, of a, of a one-hour delivery. And I think it's a very, very useful model, that model of the high cortisol society, patriarchal, high oxytocin society, harmonious and gender balanced. So, the flip side, how would we create a peaceful, ecologically intelligent society? 
you probably know already by manipulating uh, I'm sure you get the gist what we do is we manipulate childhood environments to maximize oxytocin opportunities I like to call this the high oxytocin society does your job have anything to do with this <laughs> you're starting to get the drift you already knew all this stuff You want the results, this is how we do it. Are you beginning to see that your job reaches far beyond the individual children and individual families that you directly touch? Can you reflect upon the social, political and planetary impact of the work that you do? What happens as your profession adds more oxytocin to childhood en masse? Contemplate that for a moment. So, I don't think that you are exactly revolutionaries, but you are evolutionaries. Put that on your T-shirt. <laughs> That's a merchandising idea for you guys, okay? But don't blame it on me. So, brutality was never intrinsically and unavoidably a human trait. It is formed in childhood. Here's something to practice. If you want to know why human history has been so violent, and in fact, if you want to know why any part of the world is experiencing a spike in violence, the first question to ask is what has been happening to the children? So let's take a very brief, uh, very brief, I'll make it as brief as possible, a look at why recorded history has been so incredibly violent. Psychohistorians looking through the documents, finding out what was going on for the children, discovered that in all of the major ancient civilizations, the ones that we learned about in school, infanticide was legal. Parents killed their own unwanted children or abandoned them or sold them to slavery at a rate of sometimes one in five, sometimes up to two in five. Children were regularly used as slaves. They were regularly used, and this was condoned, that they were used as sexual objects. What we now call child abuse was then called normal. Imagine, and corporal punishment was absolutely brutal and, and, uh, and unremarkable. It was so normal back then. Can you imagine the cortisol levels of the human brain in those times? Is it any wonder that back then war was indistinguishable from genocide. When there was war, they killed everybody. Genocide is a very modern um, distinction. One example, just to give you an idea of the brutality of those societies, in the Lushan Rebellion of the 8th century, in as little as nine years, two-thirds of the Chinese, the people of the Chinese Empire, were dead. Two-thirds. That was actually one-sixth of the world's population. And that's before we had guns and all of the apocalyptic weaponry that we have today. An incredible devotion to violence. In, in warrior societies, which most societies have been, the ones we're familiar with, the, there was the ritual uh, mutilation of children's bodies, the squishing of babies and little children's skulls to elongate them, to give them a flat forehead. I'm not sure why they did that. Well, actually, I do have an idea. The, the foot binding, the, the scarifying of the flesh, the knocking out of a front tooth, the uh, genital mutilation of girls and of boys. I think an attempt to raise and keep the cortisol levels at a, uh, at a high. Moving into the um, medieval era and the Renaissance era, um, uh, now my focus narrows to Europe because in this case that's all I know about. Um, parents spend very, very little time uh, with their own children. Uh, anyone that could even barely afford it, the mothers would uh, pay for a professional uh, wit nurse. And the practice of wit nursing, I'm not condemning all of it, by the way. I know some beautiful stories of sisters and friends nursing um, another mother's child. But this was widespread. Sometimes babies were given to, to complete strangers, um, to breastfeed the practice 
uh, spiked in Paris in 1780 when 80% of new babies were sent to live with a wet nurse that wasn't even in the same town as the mother. And the death rates were up to 50%. A lot of these babies just did not come home. Parents were abandoning their babies and they littered the streets. Uh, if you go to, if you're in London, visit the Robert Coram, C-O-R-A-M, the Robert Coram Museum. He was a trader, a, a wealthy man, who, who just w was so shocked by, by dying babies in the streets of London that he created the first foundling home. But towns and cities all over Europe had to build foundling homes where people could aut um, anonymous, anonymously drop off their babies through a little revolving door. And the, the conditions were appalling. Death rates were sometimes up to 90%. More babies died through abandonment than all of the plagues combined. In some parts of Europe, because girls were preferentially abandoned, the boy-to-girl ratios were, in some parts, 140 to 100. In some parts, 400 um, boys to 100 girls. I read a book called The Rise and Fall of the British Nanny, chronicling how many uh, English families would outsource child uh, rearing to a professional nanny. And there's the boarding school culture, etc. I'm not saying all boarding schools are always bad in every sense, and we have many of them in Australia, but when you see the history of, one wonders why. And when you speak to, 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 to survivors of that kind of separation from family, one wonders why. It's painful. <coughs> Turning to modern history, you all know the story of how breastfeeding was outcompeted by those that were seeking profit so that you are the front lines of bringing a practice back, a beautiful art, um, that almost disappeared by the 60s and 70s around the world. Now, here's an image of a school teacher. Psycho historians find no images of school teachers from medieval and Renaissance times without the teacher being shown to hold an instrument of punishment. And that right there is a punishment stool, a piece of furniture invented for the increasing of the cortisol levels of the child. We have been brutal towards children for a long time. Comes the Industrial Revolution and children become the workforce. Children as young as four to six sent to work as chimney sweeps, uh, working in coal mines, in, in uh, industrial mills, for up to 16 hour days. The conditions were atrocious, occupational health was non-existent and children were brutally punished if they fell asleep or lagged in their work. There's a, there's a kind of a cannibalism in the way that children have been treated and exploited. And really, no wonder, no wonder we have been at war with ourselves. No wonder. This has been driving us crazy for thousands of years. It has changed our brains and it's changed us epigenetically. But, I hope that you can see that all along, because there's some good news. Um, there, there's, there's a huge upside when you, when you look at the horrible history of parenting and education for the last eight, ten thousand years. What, what it says to me, amongst other things, is that look at what it takes to create a violent society. If we want a violent society, that's how we have to treat children. We're not born to be this way. And I hope that you can see all along it was the treatment of children and not the fact of our humanity that has produced such violence in our recorded history. Can this be reversed? You bet it can. And this has begun. And here's the exciting part of what I want to talk to you about. First of all, I want to talk to you about some extraordinary child-rearing reforms that had began to gather pace in the 20th century. Almost every nation banned the practice of child labour. It decreased from 25% uh, of the world's children in 1960 to 10% in 2003. 
Of course, that's still unacceptable. But we need to look at the decline. In 1950, 44% of the world's children... Whoops, I should not have gone to that slide, I'm sorry. In 1950, 44% of the world's children were illiterate. And this was down to 16% by the turn of the millennium. The first child protection laws began to proliferate around the world early in the 20th century. Um, and this is interesting. In 1962, an American pediatrician by the name of Henry Kempe coined the term the battered child syndrome. And this triggered a rapid growth in research and the attention given to the, to the phenomenon of physical child abuse. But this happened in 1962. Before then, um, this was something that was, did not warrant social interest. We didn't think it was interesting enough to, to be concerned about. This is quite sobering. I was, this was in my lifetime. I was one year old. The other thing that's growing, of course, is, is, uh, is the return to breastfeeding through the amazing work of the La Leche League, the Australian Breastfeeding Association, the World Health uh, Organization, and somebody called the UNICEFians. I don't know who they are, but they seem to be doing a good job wherever they are. An amazing job, in fact. So it's clawing back little by little, and you all would feel frustrated because it's not happening fast enough. I'm glad that you feel that way. But in terms of the, the, the long-term sense of you know, the, the, the timing of history, this is happening, and it cannot but have some very, very positive impacts on, on social behavior, not just on human physical health. We invented the idea of children's rights in a legislative uh, uh, sense in the 1980s, and today all nations but one, does anybody know which one? All nations have, have signed except the USA. It's a long story. <laughs> Corporal punishment of children is illegal in over 120 nations, but it is now also illegal to hit children at home. Mums and dads can't do what we used to think was ordinary not so long ago. In 47 nations now, and the list is growing, there's a United Nations uh, global initiative to earn, uh, end corporal punishment all over the world, and I'm thrilled to hear that the Republic of Ireland just as I was packing my bags to come here, the Republic of Ireland became the next nation to go. Do we have anybody from Ireland here? <laughs> what, what is in your drinking water at the moment? <laughs> you guys are amazing. I cannot believe how rapidly you're neurosocially evolving. And please send us your formula. <laughs> now, you now understand neurosocial evolution. So you can expect that if we have started to change the way that we do child rearing so significantly, by now, surely this must have triggered some kind of social changes. Let's look and see if societies have begun to evolve. In the matter of social justice, when in 1797 the abolitionists were the first group of people expressly um, set up to protect the human rights of a third party that they had never even met. Today there are over two million non-government organisations around the world fighting for other people's rights. We have the invention of the welfare state with social safety nets for the vulnerable, the old. I'm sure, by the way, none of this is good enough yet, but I'm talking in terms of evolution. The women's suffrage of the 20th century, and in fact, the whole women's rights movement since the 1960s and 70s. The union movement, fair labour laws, the eight-hour day, anti-racial vilification laws proliferating around the world, rights for sexual minorities, gay marriage in Spain, Holland, the United Kingdom, my country of birth, Uruguay, Argentina, New Zealand, I hope one day the country uh, in which I live, Australia, uh, joins the 20th century, let alone the 21st. 
It's a funny place, Australia. Lovely weather, but I don't know what, what, what they're doing in Canberra, the politicians. The democracy, democracy has been growing remarkably. Um, as a disclaimer, I think democracy is still very much in its infancy and full of inadequacies. But based on just the most basic definition of democracy, our, our right to express our opinion and for our, our opinion to be valued, for us not to be punished for our opinions. Just, just that as the core definition. And we began in the modern era to dabble quite seriously with democratic processes in the nation state, in Holland, in England, in France, in the USA. In 1985, there were 44 democracies in the year 2000. There were 82. In 2013, there were 123. And sometimes countries devolve. But I'm very excited about what just happened in Burma. Uh, this is the first time, it has no precedent, the first time in human history that there have been more democracy, uh, democracies than dictatorships. And there is... Um, uh, Students of, of, of um, political science and, and of conflict studies, they have a theory called the democratic peace theory in which having done an enormous amount of statistical research, the finding is that it is almost completely unheard of for two democracies to go to war against one another. So democracy of itself has, is, a, is, is a spectacular driver of world peace. There are some new emerging instruments to democracy. Democracy is no longer just about voting once every four years and going home. What I mean by that, some examples is citizen-led petitions, divestment campaigns related to fossil fuel uh, companies, consumer boycotts that have been very, very, uh, very effective around the world um, in, in targeting the big corporations when their practices are hurting the environment or hurting human beings. And there's, of course, social media, Wikipedia, wiki uh, leaks, participatory budgeting. This is where, uh, this is growing very rapidly in South America, where you don't just vote once every few years. You vote, you get a vote on all of the major budgetary decisions along the way. And this has been around long enough for them to do the research. They found that municipalities that implement participatory budgeting are, f are far more advanced in terms of infrastructure, education, health, etc. Human rights lawyers call this the age of enforcement of human rights. Since the Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 and the invention of the term crimes against humanity, the Nuremberg trials, the Tokyo trials, for the first time in, living, in, in history, in recorded history, being the leader of a nation, the president, etc., no longer guarantees any immunity. What was once uh, excused under the rubric of war is no longer uh, tolerable. And we have the International Court of Criminal Justice in The Hague, where leaders from many nations, from Croatia, Serbia, Rwanda, Uganda, have been prosecuted. This has been ratified by over 100 nations. Again, the USA has not yet to ratify that. There's been the truth commissions in Africa and South Africa. There is Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, hundreds of NGOs, working so hard to protect human rights around the world. Uh, in 1990, only 10% of the world's nations had ratified all of the six major human rights instruments. By the year 2000, that was almost half of the world's nations. Again, I want to say, we're not there yet. There are still horrible things going on around the world, but geez, we're moving. Animals, we're trying to learn how to give animal, uh, animals their rights. Since the Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals um, uh, in, in, in England in the 19th century, which came before the Society of the Prevention of Cruelty to Human Children, by the way. And we have cruelty-free products, the rise of vegetarianism, veganism, cage-free farming, and animals being recognised as sentient beings uh, recently in Australia and in New Zealand. Some big implications for this. Now, this is interesting. And... and um, kind of a different, difficult concept to grapple with, especially in the light of the horrible things that have just been happening in, in, in the Middle East, in Lebanon, in Paris. But violence, statistically, 
around the planet has been decreasing very rapidly. In the ancient world, one out of four people would die as a result of battle. In pre-modern era, the Napoleonic era, that was uh, down to 10%. The World Health Organization says today it is down to 0.3%. Homicide, on average, this is an average, is 10 times less than it was two centuries ago. We have United Nations peacekeeping forces. They have reduced civil war recidivism by about 80% on average. And now the non-violent activist is the hero, not the guy with the gun. So Gandhi, Mandela, Luther King, Rosa Parks, Aung San Suu Kyi. And we, we have all kinds of non-violent um, activism handbooks and manuals and people that are experts in this going around teaching activists and there's the sense of the peaceful boycott for activists. There were even further declines in homicide and domestic violence in the USA, in Britain and Europe during the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Okay, so we know that we're not yet in a peaceful world. The gains I've mentioned are not enough, and there's still a lot of avoidable horror. But it would be blindness to deny the dramatic evolution of recent decades. Societies are changing very fast now, and child-rearing reforms are a major driver of this change via the mechanism of neurosocial evolution. I want to take a, a small peek at what can happen in one nation. Surprise, surprise, Sweden is the one I want to talk about. The first country in 1979 to ban the corporal punishment of children, long before we even had the research showing us how bad it is. One of the first countries to have complete uh, national compliance, every maternity ward, baby friendly. One of the first. Of, you know, a little surprise that they have a higher breastfeeding rate than, than many of the rest of us. They have beautiful uh, parental leave provisions, 18 months for mothers, and, and, and mothers are paid, I think, about 75 or 80% of whatever they, they were earning before the birth of the child. Fathers are paid for one month as well to stay close to their children. They have open preschools where the teachers go to meet the child in their home environment first until they get to know each other well, and the parents are allowed to enter into the preschool to hang out with the kids. And so the children experience much less of the, of the traumatic elements of separation anxiety in early life. And they have banned all advertising that targets children under 12. What have these child rearing reforms created for Sweden? Let's take a look. Drops in child abuse. Drops in youth crime and in youth substance abuse. Sweden has the lowest homicide rate in the world. Uh, quite a while ago, the Swedish government committed to having no fossil fuels by 2020. They are now racing, I think, neck and neck with Costa Rica to, to be 100% reliant on uh, renewables. Can you see how this even translates to how we treat our non-human environment, not just how we treat each other? It translates to deep empathy towards Mother Earth and all sentient beings, the Earth that we depend on. They, they have the highest gender equality in the world. They're always in the top 10 for the Global Peace Index and the Sustainability Index. Did you know, by the way, that Sweden has run out of garbage? <laughs> they don't have enough garbage, so they import garbage from England and from Norway and from Italy, and, and you, you pay the Swedish uh, to take your garbage, and they process it wonderfully and make energy out of it and all kinds of recycled goods. That's pretty amazing, I think. The third least corrupt country in the world, according to Transparent International, the fourth most democratic uh, country, according to the Democracy Index, and I don't really understand how they measure this, but they're the second happiest country in the world despite their terrible weather. <laughs> what are the child-rearing reforms that I see around the world? As I see it, okay, and, and you'll add all kinds of categories to this list, reforms to childbirth, 
to make childbirth more, there's all those wonderful movements of naturalizing childbirth and taking defensive obstetrics out of it to aid in the bonding. You know, the water birth movement, the home birth movement, the midwife-led childbirth movement. Uh, you've probably heard about the return to breastfeeding, so that I don't, don't need to harangue you about that one. Thanks to you guys for the work that you do. Um, there's been a, a, a fairly international response to all of this research about the early mother-infant attachment. Thousands of studies. It's getting popularized and all of the research into early childhood um, um, neurological development, neuropsychological development. It's creating waves of new styles of parenting that try to interpret the results of that research and to adapt it into the home. And people call themselves attachment parents and natural parents and continuum parents. And frankly, I don't care. You can call yourself whatever uh, the fancy uh, takes you. But, but definitely this effort with all of its mistakes and blunders, this wonderful effort to be more responsive to the emotional needs of children and babies. We're more than just providers. We are the empathy farmers of the next generation. The rise of non-violent, non-authoritarian authority for parents. I showed you earlier the number of nations that have banned the corporal punishment of children. And this conviction that it's really, really worthwhile for governments to open up the purse and to give money to early intervention initiatives. The research is amazingly positive. So we now have all kinds of early intervention strategies the International Society for Early Intervention. intervention. Uh, there is also um, a, uh, the growth of this thing called the um, uh, trauma-informed community. Have you heard about that? Entire states um, in, in, in North America, and pro uh, the province of um, Alberta and Canada, Iowa, Arizona and the states, parts of Washington, municipalities and entire states up there where the government be be becomes... Uh, they, they learn to completely understand uh, the need for asking the question, not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you. And this is a huge driver of neurosocial evolution. And of course, this gave rise, all of this research, to the new, uh, new field, new um, faculty of infant mental health. They put out some great statements. I'll talk uh, uh, on infant mental health um, and I'll mention some things from the Australian Association of Infant Mental Health in my uh, presentation tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm also, I, I won't go on about this, but I'm very excited about the rise of the emergent curriculum and democratic styles of education where children are helped to learn according to their passion, to learn what they love, not what somebody forces them to learn. And there's many names for this all around the world. It's a new phenomenon that I've been researching. What they all say is, is something that really excites me. Not only the kids are happier and they're better off academically, but um, it's a very consistent finding that these kinds of new educational philosophies are reducing bullying in the classroom and in the playground to the point that these new, um, uh, this new evolving style of education, I think, is a treatment for social violence. So I didn't want to dwell on Sweden. It's not because they're Swedish. We can have all of that and better in any country. There is no nation on this earth. In fact, I was saying earlier there are no nations as far as I'm concerned. But, but if we share a human biology, we can produce what nation produced and better absolutely anywhere, and we will. Sounds like Ireland is catching up, that's for sure. So we've achieved so much in neurosocial evolutionary terms so quickly. How much more can we achieve? The work that you do makes you a social activist. So I think your role is global in scope and it is huge. I'd like you to ponder for a moment, contemplate. What was it that made you choose the work that you do? What has been your personal vision for the future that you're trying to contribute to. And do you acknowledge that vision to yourself? Do you make it conscious? Do you define it? Having heard what you've just heard this morning, how do you see your personal role in helping to create 
this vision? Are there any new commitments that you would like to make regarding your work as a parent uh, and, and as a professional? If you can see that your hand is on the neurosocial evolutionary wheel, what kind of world do you want your grandchildren and, in fact, everybody else's grandchildren to live in? And what if your work and the way that you touch families is the doorway to this world?